My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. This is an introductory high-tech uh, college course lecture, and uh, this is in a course required for uh, information systems students and uh, uh, also popular elective often required for computer science students on and off over the years and required for computer engineers until recently. This lecture is about understanding the power that you're bringing into a building uh, for your computing system. So uh, this is something you typically would want a professional electrical engineer, licensed engineer to do, especially on large uh, buildings. And um, let me share a screen here. Uh, so we're in this course uh, right here. And uh, what we're going to do is, um, if you saw behind me, I'll stop sharing for a second here, but you see behind me, uh, what's on the board here is understanding some of the variables involved. So power uh, is our main concern and uh, voltage and current are variables that are part of that. Also understanding DC versus AC circuits. And then really also uh, something about the quality of the power too. So you see an example behind me of uh, reactive power uh, that is uh, not good for the power grid. It affects uh, your, your, your costs that you get charged by the power company. Uh, and there's ways to deal with that and mitigate that. Uh, so these are some of the things you wanna consider when you are putting power into big, big buildings. Um, so uh, I'm 60 years old now, and uh, I spent the first half of my life in architectural things, including building buildings. So uh, there's something in here that uh, I want to show you um, and my portfolio. So I'm a mixture of high tech and architecture over the past 30 years. Um, and you can see this architect this is my architecture portfolio and have the things I've done in high tech and then uh, architectural things, including building high tech office parks. I want to show you these two uh, projects here because they involve bringing in clean power and putting in raised floor computer rooms as well as uh, concurrent manufacturing, which can get in the way. Uh, so let me go down here to those. Uh, so I've, I've had 12 small residential projects of my own commissions. And then I worked uh, for developers out west uh, in the 1980s. And so these buildings here, I was a project manager in charge of all these buildings, including all, all of the construction and all of the engineering and architecture as well. And put in a raised floor computer room of IBM 360. And this building here for an auto parts company, they took the whole building and for a pharmaceutical company over here. Now, the one building for the pharmaceutical comp company didn't, it didn't need as much uh, intense computing, uh, but the auto parts company did. And unfortunately, the leasing company, actually this guy right here, he, uh, he, he signed a lease to get these people in, uh, believe it or not, in six weeks. And we, haven't, we hadn't even broken ground yet. So I took people off for all the other buildings and then he also signed for um, so much KBA, not even knowing what that means. And I had to go and get the engineers and electrical people to trench all the way out uh, to the main grid uh, connects and, and put in power uh, for the cooling uh, as well as, because these are all liquid cooled back then. Uh, we didn't, I worked for IBM when I, later on when I went into high tech. And at that time we switched to CMOS and the big reason was because it runs co cooler uh, even though it took a performance hit at the time, uh, people paid a million dollars for the machines and they run their, uh, you know, the countries off of this air traffic control, the New York Stock Exchange, um, military defense systems. Uh, so, you know, you want to really know about that. Now, luckily, I was an engineer and I knew enough to get a professional, you know, professional electrical power people involved. That time I was an architectural engineer. I hadn't gone back to school yet for urban design and physics and then engineering science and electrical engineering. 
So I just knew to get somebody. And so the information systems people in here, they're going to rise to you know, chief information officer in their career. I mean, that's probably an aspiration or somewhere up the ranks. And they'll be making decisions of when to call in expertise. You really need to have experts in electrical power to put this in, not computer engineering, electrical power engineers. Uh, and then this was my office and everything. I have all their stories about research. I had an estimating business to put myself through school with and uh, my secretary in my office. So, and then I moved to California, did more development. I built, uh, 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 there was only a small group of us, a guy with a lot of money and then a, an accountant and a secretary. And then I ran all the architecture and engineering and seven big projects, including putting all this in. And uh, that's what it looked like back then. I was kind of a baby, but the, the guy with all the money was only 35. And so uh, I was 24 or five, something like that. Um, and we built all this. And so this was light manufacturing as well as uh, office space. And in here, uh, we're gonna talk about that today. Uh, if you have machinery, if you have motors, uh, that's gonna create a, a reactive power that uh, puts your, your current out of phase with your voltage and you get penalized. I mean, it messes up the power grid like that. You can't deliver, get power delivered over the grid as easily. And, it, and we'll look at other things too uh, with clean power uh, that can really mess up happier, good quality computing. Uh, the, the motor's not so much the reactive power, but the something cyclical on the power grid can actually get into your system. And, uh, and, and there's other things, of course, surges, spikes, swells, uh, sags. We're gonna look at that. <clears throat> so now we wanna go back into this course um, in the high tech pages here. And go, uh, by the way, this is all, all this video is going to go onto YouTube into a lecture series. Um, and you also have a, a PDF to click on in the comments on the YouTube to get the links and things like that. And then syllabi. So I've taught 40 different courses and uh, including at Purdue things on power and controls. Uh, we're doing this intro course here in high tech right now. And so we're in here. And what we're going to do is um, Go down in here now for clean power one and two. Uh, and there's certain standards you want to design to, specify to. And we're going to uh, listen to some pre recorded videos that I made lectures in 2020 there, and then discuss a little bit in between. And then also before that, uh, before that, I want to go in here into the modules. Uh, we had a little primer in the beginning about just Ohm's law and the voltage and current and resistance. We won't watch that again, uh, but I want to just give a little refresher down here of uh, a five minute core, uh, video on uh, uh, just voltage and current uh, and, and basic current laws before we go uh, forward. And then we already saw this one. And then after all that, we'll we talk about power factor, the things what was behind me on the board and, um, and how to deal with all that. Uh, we might do that in the next lecture or at the end of today, if we have time. So I'm going to pause here. Okay, students just watched a couple of very good videos on the basic electricity, uh, current versus voltage. So the things behind me, hopefully make a little more sense um, <clears throat> that we're gonna talk about a little more here. So I'm gonna share screen again. Controls in the way here. Oh, gotta wait for the window to get out of the way. Right. No, meeting controls. I'd uh, meeting controls. <clears throat> So we were in here. Uh, this is our Canvas educational database. So anybody who's missing today and watching this, go back and make sure you watch these two. We had already watched this one before, uh, but you, you learn about resistance there in Ohm's law. So I just had everybody watch one video in the beginning, a general one, but uh, this is sort of a refresher. And we'll come back and watch these later. And um, <clears throat> so now we want to go uh, back into here. Uh, where does this go? Get it again. Yeah. And we want to watch these. So this is a, uh, let's see, I feel, I'll play the MP4. Yeah. 
My name is Professor Joseph Wunderlich, Professor of Engineering, Architecture, and Computer Science. And this is uh, some notes from a standard for how to uh, specify clean power. And you typically want a professional licensed uh, electrical power engineer to do that for you, even if you're a computer engineer and licensed as a professional engineer. You probably want a, a large scale system, a large building, large computer room floor hire a consultant to take the liability and stamp the drawings uh, and specify what the contractors will bid on. So this is uh, details here. Now there's a lecture that follows uh, this that has uh, notes from when I taught this at Purdue University plus some stories and life experience and also professional engineering um, medicals exam review notes. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here but this is the actual specification uh, for the curve that's going to be described in the next lecture. So you can skim through this here and just realize there's a bunch of problems with power and you want to understand what they are. Uh, and so you have you know, a number of different things you want to consider, as you'll see here in each of these items and how to mitigate that. And then there'll be this curve and this, a copy of this will be in the next lecture and you will see that uh, how each of these regions, so all of the different problems have a certain uh, duration of time where you can withstand it without causing damage or you know, allowing the computer to still, or whatever, to still uh, function uh, without interruption. So you want to, uh, you want to take a look at that and uh, in the next, uh, don't stare at it too much here. You, you may want to come back and refer to this later. This is the actual specification that would be not obvious, but would be well known to a professional electrical engineer. Uh, and you will learn about it in the next lecture that accompanies this. Okay, go to the next part of that where things are detailed. My name is Professor Joseph Wonderlich and I am a professor of engineering, computer science, and architecture of buildings. <clears throat> um, this is a lecture on power. And firstly, uh, we want to just understand what's coming out of the wall. The United States is 120 volts, can be 110, 115, depending where you're on power grid. Uh, it can be typically 240 ish um, in other countries. And there's reasons for that. It's a little more unsafe to transmit at 240, but your I squared R current times resistance square losses are less. So it's more energy efficient to transmit at higher voltages, but less safe. So it's a, you know, it's a judgment call what you want to do there. Uh, anyway, we have 120 volts coming out of the wall. You have both current and voltage in, in sync. Um, that can shift one way or the other. The current can be out of phase with the voltage if you have you know, reactive power, inductance, or capacitance. We'll just touch on that a little bit in this lecture. Um, you have to transform this AC voltage down to a D or, or to a lower voltage. Uh, the chips need typically five volts if it's bipolar TTL kind of transistors, or CMOS three and a half volts, uh, or you might need twelve volts for your uh, motor, duty 12 volts for your motors and your drives or optical drives and your magnetic drives are spinning, not your solid state. Also, your fans need 12 volts. Then you need to rectify. So you need to make it not alternating anymore. It has to be just a flat uh, voltage level. So you make it to zero. Uh, zero voltage would be grounding equivalent to logic one for binary. And then your, your five or three and a half volts, high level, constant levels would be direct current would be for logic one, and that's what you feed your motherboard. Uh, now, uh, continuing on power, these are some standardized notes from when I was a professor at Purdue University, a big university with as many as seven or eight people teaching a course at any given time across all the branch campuses also that were not autonomous. So committee established these notes, and then you see my handwritten notes over top of it. We we're talking about clean power now, and the reality of you have you know 70 disturbances a year typically, uh, customers um, uh, you know problems with 
external plan. So uh, I have some experience building buildings. Um, my bachelor's degree is architectural engineering in 1984 from the University of Texas in Austin. And it allowed me to get, uh, if I wish, licensing for engineering or architecture. So we see, uh, and of these notes of when I went back, master's PhD, I did research, a research professor at Purdue University, uh, teaching about power in this particular course. Uh, but I mentioned that because I, I needed to understand this particular topic when I was building buildings too, including um, high-tech office parks in Texas and California, uh, in charge of building ways, computer floor rooms. Uh, <clears throat> so with uh, heating and cooling needs, cooling more importantly, actually, at the time, I don't want to get on a tangent with that, uh, voltage, uh, so categories of power problems, you have uh, variations and interruptions and transients, which are temporary and starting up systems, robots or whatever, motors, the startup phase is a transient, and then steady state is after the transient, but you can have problems with uh, some harmonics, waves, uh, different causes. Also, um, you can have wire grounding problems. What you see here are my review notes that I purchased when studying for uh, the professional engineering fundamentals licensing exam that you take when you're a student. Uh, so I took that and passed it in 1983. And I just thought this would be a nice thing uh, to compare uh, the, uh, the analogy between mechanical and electrical and fluid and thermal. Uh, so it helps you better understand you know, electrical current is sort of like fluid flow. And there's, the, the analogies don't hold everywhere. And voltage is sort of like a fluid pressure. And I always thought that was nice. But you know, I've had an education all over the place in electrical, mechanical, architectural. Um, so I like the analogies perhaps more than some people. Um, also, you, you do want to understand here before we proceed, uh, power P is in, in watts. Uh, R is resistance measured in ohms. And then here's some basic formulas you should know. Voltage equals IR, voltage equals current times resistance. And power equals I squared R. Uh, it's current squared times R, which also equals IV. And uh, I could tell a whole story here of why you transmitted higher voltages on uh, uh, in, in Europe and other places because you have less I squared R losses. Uh, you know, it's more energy efficient. However, it's more dangerous uh, if you have 240 volts going into your every house outlet. Here's just a little more uh, of the analogies here uh, from the, the book. And uh, I, you know, again, I like to look at things so you, uh, like this, comparing uh, electrical, mechanical, thermodynamics, and fluids, and courses and all that, just like mechanical engineers, uh, a ton of structural and a sufficient amount of electrical and architectural engineering to understand what to do with build buildings. And then, of course, a great deal more for master's PhD in electrical and computer engineering. And again, some more uh, now. So you may want to stop and take a look at this. Uh, before we move on from here, professional licensing is important for anybody dealing with the safety of the public. Structural, of course, it's critical. Things fall down and kill people if you don't do that right. Electrical power, yes, that can kill people. Machinery, yes, mechanical is needed for sure. Um, architecturals fall into those categories, yes. Electrical, other than power, was questionable for a while. Control systems, control systems, you know, can, big machinery can kill people. What about computing? For a long time, it was debatable. But now I don't want to give a whole sermon here, but the artificial intelligence and autonomous systems controlled by computer engineering decisions and designs can kill people. So I encourage all engineers, including computer engineers, to seriously consider getting a license. You get a, you know, you get a process, you got to first pass the fundamentals exam, spend four years under a licensed architect. Uh, be a professor too, and I can oops, certainly take the exam now if I wish. Say engineer there, but professional yeah. licensing, and then you get this stamp, and then when you stamp drawings and designs, you're now assuming liability 
which you might want to be careful with because you will get sued if people get hurt because the system that you stand drawings for uh, fails. But you get paid quite a bit of money by people to assume that liability and that supervision. So you should consider, even if you don't practice as a professional engineer, it's, uh, if you have an ABET accredited degree, undergraduate degree, like computer engineering is, uh, Elizabeth Town, and the other engineering degrees, then you can get licensed. If it's not ABET accredited, you can't get licensed. Now back to these Purdue, Purdue uh, lecture notes. Of course, I was teaching on power and control directly combined into one course. Um, <clears throat> We want to look at the different things that can happen uh, or that you want to control, design around, or you know, mitigate when you're specifying clean power, asking consultants to do that for you. So this is, you know, IEEE, Institute of Electrical Electronic Engineers, setting standards in all kinds of electrical things, including computers, and certainly power. Uh, and then in terminology, in IEEE terminology, the first thing is interruption or a dropout. Uh, also referred to as an outage, so a total loss of voltage for some duration. So this, we all understand what that is. You lose your power. Now the next thing, maybe not quite as uh, uh, common to understand, is a transient, so a temporary startup of something, a surge. So you see voltage over time here, uh, and some causes. So initial energizing of power faction correction capacity. Now that to fully understand takes some more uh, lectures and other courses um, for electrical engineers, power engineers, you should certainly understand that. But what you have is real and reactive power, uh, uh, loads and reactive loads and inductance and capacitance in it. The real, uh, the, the real is pure resistance, uh, it doesn't cause problems. But when you have inductance or capacitance like motors in a factory, um, you have inductance and then you want to cancel out the negative effect with capacitance if you have too many inductors from the motors. Because what happens is your voltage and current get out of phase with each other and messes up the delivery of power. And so and then the power factory is a, an angle between the phasers that represent the two sine waves of the current and voltage um, angle between those two vector representation, phase representation of the sine waves. So if you understand sine waves and phasers, you Current and voltage that would make sense to you. If not, don't worry about it. Hire a professional electrical engineer to do the power thing, especially if you need a bank of capacitors in your factory to cancel, cancel out the power factor problems because of the inductance of your motors, which you get penalized for, by the way, from the power company in, your, in the cost, and the rate that they charge you. So um, that's for another lecture. Uh, 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 also switching transmission lines. There's some stations, big giant switches. Which, uh, Purdue, I took students on field trips. These are big science fiction looking switches. Some of these things, a big giant ball that swings on the end of an arm that connects to super high voltage at the, you know, a substation. Otherwise it's gonna arc across and just you know simple switching, um, like you'd see a circuit breaker kind of thing, smaller scale. So that, you know, those, those are little blips that can happen as cause a surge, a surge. And a surge can blow out a circuit. Uh, in olden days more, even static shocks would blow out your circuits. And one reason putting bipolar transistors around the rim of your chips and CMOS in the middle is the bipolar could uh, handle the shock. The pinouts are. Uh, that, that's not quite an issue anymore as much, but, uh, Still, you don't want a huge surge coming in uh, that'll blow out the most recent of chips. Uh, next, we want to consider a, uh, a sag. So that's just a, uh, a small drop in voltage. And you're saying, well, that can't be a problem. Well, yes, because you, you know you, everything inside the computer is actually um, not digital, it's made to digital, but you know, when you have capacitance charging up on a gate or on a signal line, uh, that voltage isn't always going to be exactly five volts. It's especially if you have a fan out, we have a one thing circuit driving a bunch of others, the signal degrades. And if you've got a drop in your initial power to the machine, uh, you, know, you could have 
the bit errors and the thing just not functioning. And that's some of the worst kind of errors where it's intermittent. And, uh, so you don't, you don't want a say uh, for your computer. Also a swell, next thing, you don't want to see that. And um, uh, so, you know, oh, uh, uh, you see the arrow here, a fault. We have a short circuit, we have temporary like a short, where somebody, you know, does something stupid and, and it's a, a short circuit or overload loads an outlet or something. At first you'll have a sag and then the breaker will trip, which will cause a swell. Um, and then, you know, then shut off. So, uh, the, the, you know, you, you have to filter out these things. It's essentially what you need to do for clean power. Now, this here is uh, a graph from the um, Information Technology Industry Council, which is part of this CDEMA. Uh, uh, So this graph, which on the next slide, I have the actual graph from the society, from the council, and uh, describes it a little more. But what this does is it looks at each, you'll see each of the different things, um, you know, solid state tolerances, swells, surges, high frequency lightning, under voltage interruption. Steady state. And then, um, how long you can handle that on the x-axis. So you see on the y-axis voltages varying around um, a baseline voltage that you want, you know. And so how much how much can you uh, withstand? On the next, you'll see on the next page a little more detail of describing this. So I'll wait till we get to that next one. And then uh, lastly, before we go to that next slide, look at the details of this uh, ITIC curve. We talk about harmonics. So um, Fourier, Fourier series components, waves, you know, wave interference. What can happen is you have AC power being delivered to your, to your building, to your computer rooms. And then if there's a factory nearby or other sources, uh, generators and things, there's harmonics that can come across the power grid and the waves uh, superimpose on each other, creating uh, problems, right? And the wave theory, you know, resonant frequencies and things like that. So um, that's something you have to monitor too and, and control, not just monitor, but filter out there, mitigate. Now here's the actual graph the standards that a professional electrical engineer will write specifications for the contractors to bid on and that will ensure the computer company, information officer for a large company perhaps, uh, that your computers will not fail under different circumstances. And so you see each of the things here, um, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six um, that we've discussed and how to, uh, to you know, how to specify allowable um, variations or you know, mitigations to things that could happen. So what you see on the right-hand side here, it says 120 volts or in red, that, that's the, that's the, uh, the RMS and the root squared, the, the voltage that you want to uh, have as your baseline that you're expecting. Now you can ex you can handle a certain uh, standard deviation from that without any loss of function. And so what you see now on the x-axis is the duration that you can withstand a certain problem. And so you can see that uh, there's no limit to how long you can withstand going down to 100 or up to 132 volts or uh, down to uh, I guess it's 100. But uh, you know, plus or minus a certain amount of uh, you know, ten percent or so uh, for an unlimited period of time. Um, now, what you see in some of these other things is, um, and you know, I'm expecting to know every detail of this in an introductory course. But um, 
Let's see. So let's start. Um, so, um, well, I'm just look at all the different things. We'll start at the very top here. It's like a high frequency surge up there. So you can only handle a very small amount. Uh, and, and these are in uh, milliseconds, I believe, down the small scale here. Yeah, on the x axis. So, you know, you can only, uh, I mean, you can't really handle a surge at, at all uh, if it's a lightning strike. Uh, but, you know, you can handle certain voltage, high voltage surges up to a certain amount. So you can see there is a high frequency surge lightning. Uh, it's plus 5,000 or 500 percent equals six, 600 volts for uh, uh, 10 negative fourth milliseconds. So 100 microseconds. But um, you want to avoid the joules of energy. Joules is, is, is the voltage times time. So like if uh, I put an electric fence around my farmland here and uh, uh, it's many thousand volt joules, but it's it's uh, or it's 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 many thousand volts, but it's such a short period of time because joules is voltage times time. And so, you know, you, you take a look at all of these things. Uh, don't try to memorize all of them. Just realize that they're, all these characteristics are uh, kind of represented on the same graph here. Of how long you can withstand a certain one of these uh, problems. And you want to have a system designed to handle that. Right, so um, let me uh, stop sharing for a second. Then you look behind me, um, we'll see some of what we're going to discuss now and watch some, some videos on it. I don't have a separate lecture on it. But if you just look behind me, we've already talked about uh, these equations up above, you know, our power equals current times voltage or current squared times uh, resistance. And then uh, we're going to talk about power now and watts. And this is probably what you're going to start with. Like, you know, how much power do you need for your computers? Uh, even just putting in computer science department or engineering department uh, offices. And those professors have more machines in there typically. So when we spec this building I'm in right now in 2008, uh, we, we ask for more wattage per room uh, just because we're going to be running experimental machines and things. Um, then you already learned about DC versus AC behind me. And then these loads here. Now, you haven't learned about the loads yet. And in this video I'm going to post on YouTube, uh, what I'm saying right here is all that's going to be on there. But uh, there's different kinds of load. If you have a purely resistive load, it doesn't mess with uh, putting your current and voltage out of phase and cost you money to, as a penalty to the power company because you're messing up the power grid. As soon as you start putting inductive loads on, uh, and then and the capacitance is not as much of trouble as the inductance, and you usually use capacitive loads to help solve the problem that the inductance is causing. But you have this, uh, this thing down here, which is uh, the power factor. The power factor is the cosine theta of this angle, where you have your real power down here, which would be purely resistive, and then your apparent power in the hypotenuse. And that's, uh, that's a result of this reactive power caused by uh, things, you know, the resistance, of, uh, the inductance of capacitance. So if you got inductors making your, your reactive power big because you have motors uh, in your factory and you're getting penalized for that and the people down the road are complaining about it or you're complaining to the people down the road because you're a computer company trying to run your computers and the factories all around you are messing up the power grid, then, uh, you, you know, you lobby or, you know, uh, try to help mitigate that. And you put capacitors, banks of capacitors in the factory in parallel with the uh, motors and inductors and it cancels out and it fixes the, the power factor. Okay. Um, so students in this class, I would want you to understand these equations up above and basic power and voltage uh, things. And everything was in those lectures too. I don't memorize the ITRC graph, but the fact that there are certain durations for each of those things, maybe a little a sentence or two about what uh, what is standardized there in that graph. Um, and then again, 
you really, even if you're an engineer, even if you're a licensed computer engineer, licensed mechanical, licensed in electrical, but not power, you want to get a licensed power engineer to uh, uh, for, for a race for a computer room. No, not if you're just building a house or something or a small apartment building or whatever, a small office complex. Or if you're building a race for computer room that's serving lots of people with a million dollar computer in it, this is IBM 360s uh, that I ended up working on in the 1990s, uh, they're million dollar machines. <clears throat> and so uh, you have to give clean power and the, the tenant or the owner, or, you know, whoever, whoever's the customer uh, at the other end of what gets specified by the engineers and architects will demand this. And somebody will be liable if it doesn't work. All right, so I think, stop recording and then play it. Oh, let me just show what I'm gonna play a couple more of here for students if you are students in my class missing today screen controls and zoom screen controls out of the way so i can see the other thing hide floating meeting controls somebody should fix that um course modules so we're going to now watch couple more videos here in the class. And uh, if you're not here today, please watch those. And then I believe it looks like we have enough time here just to watch these videos and then we can move on to something completely different next time, uh, which I'll just give the students a heads up here on what that's going to be. We'll go back in here in the syllabus again. And um, so we're moving into now, uh, machine intelligence and neural network uh, code runs. So uh, I teach a course in robotics and machine intelligence. And so this is little snippets out of that. Some neural network code I developed in the early 1990s in the pursuit or as part of the process of developing neural network chips in 91 and 93, two of them. And so we'll do that. It's just an introduction to all that. And then we'll do some virtual reality things. We have some, some of that here. Uh, I started that in this lab here a couple of years ago. Now we have more. And then some somewhat philosophical things on human versus machine intelligence. And then some kind of fun stuff in architectural servers and Minecraft world server stuff that I ran here for years, 10 years ago. And then uh, I got uh, invited to some conferences to give talks and then some more stuff, technology, humanity, and uh, some other things, cybersecurity kind of things down there. So that reminds me, next time we have a cybersecurity guest, I guess I'm going to put that on there. On here, but the next Wednesday, our class does. I'll put a note on the door. Class actually starts at 3 30 in here because that's our cybersecurity guest in the other class. I'll remind everybody. Okay, so let me stop sharing here, stop recording, stop sharing, stop recording. Yes.